Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Matthew. I'm an alcoholic. Man, I don't care that somebody just tagged me speak moments ago. It's fine. I, my story doesn't change because you asked me a week ago or just now. What I do mind is trying to talk about myself for only 10 minutes. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I got a lot to say. You know, I drank. Oh, Brian wants me to stand up. I stand up for it. Hey, hey. Uh, I drank for a long time. I started drinking at 10 or 11, huffing gas, eating uh, hallucinogenic shrooms that grew in our yard up in Washington. Long before puberty, I was not comfortable in this world. And then puberty hit. That that didn't help. Uh, you know? So... Um, I didn't drink. Uh, I hear uh, some young people share, like, they just start drinking out the gate. I, I mean, sometimes when I drank, I got really drunk. But I didn't drink every day by any means, you know, until my uh, uh, mid-20s, probably, I was a daily drinker. I'd gotten into construction, and I, you know, would work on houses and then go to the bar and drink. Um, by my, by, uh, and I played around with drugs. Um, like cocaine, I do cocaine. I had a friend who in construction who really liked that cocaine, and he give it to me. It's hard to refuse free drugs for me, <laughs> and, uh, but I do not like cocaine. Um, every time I did it, I did not like it. I'm like, ah, but I really did like that meth, meth and <laughs> and, um, So I would do meth. Um, I kept it recreational, you know, um, just a social thing uh, <laughs> until around 30. And um, the thing with addictive substances, you keep doing them, you get addicted. You know? So around 30, um, I was drinking every day, um, and then I was doing meth every day. And uh, it just went south. And some things happened. Um, I went to see this girl who'd left me in, uh, in L.A., and she's like, what are you doing here? Um, I was on my way to join the Army, actually. <laughs> That's a story. Um, I, I, at 30, I was like, I was so uh, bewildered by what was going on in my life, and my inability to uh, figure out relationships and jobs and and the, and the world was just such a hostile place. All the wars and violence and rape. And, just, um, and, and no, and, uh, and I couldn't. Uh, anyways, she left me at 26. She realized she's, you know, who she's dating. And, and she, uh, I was so in love and the bottom just fell out. And, um, and so at 30, I went to see her. I thought maybe she could help me out. And she's like, what's, what are you doing in L.A.? And I was like, oh, I, well, I didn't want to join the army, so I came to see you. And, uh, and she she basically paid me, put gas in my truck, and leave. And um, and when uh, somebody who who had at one point agreed to marry you, uh, is uh, putting gas in your truck so you can get out of her town, uh, it's really demoralizing. And um, and I kind of marked that. It's just sort of my bottom. Um, I've been selling my tool. Um, so yeah, I went from like lead carpenter to carpenter to guy in the ditch digging the ditches to just the guy out on telegraph trying to uh, scrape up enough money for a sack and uh, and uh, that and fast all in, all around the age of thirty. And I just stayed out there till thirty five, you know, just dragging along in that existence and. Got 12 stepped into AA. Um, I don't know what to say about that. It's, 
you know, I was drinking in the bathrooms and a couple of times I smoked a little, maybe a little meth in the bathroom at meetings. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I, I was trying, you know, I was going to a lot of meetings and I had a sponsor. If you're listening, I just did air quotes uh, around, around the name of the word <laughs> sponsor and, uh, and um, commitments and everything. And I kept just kept getting loaded. And finally, though, I hit this point where I just uh, called it some. I it just went dark, and and um, the dark. That's the thing is the darkness kept increasing, and I so I would drink more alcohol. Um, and for a while I worked more and then the alcohol and work wasn't covering the darkness anymore. It was just getting too big. I couldn't work my way around that inner darkness. And so then I threw meth in, make a nice cocktail. Uh, so at 35, it just wasn't working. Nothing was working anymore. And I was, uh, I was like, I can't live like this anymore. And, um, I was, I was just done. And then I had this crazy thought that um, uh, said to me, it's like, you don't have to do this. I was looking at my suicide, you know, and um, this thought goes, you don't have to do this. And I went towards that thought. Really weird. I don't know where that thought came from. I was uh, completely twacked out of my head. and uh, I was in the tenderloin, um, hanging out in some dark places. and um, So I went with that thought. I called my sponsor up and and I said, uh, I need to work the steps. And I started working the steps. It's been a fucking crazy journey. I'm so psyched right now. Um, I just went and bought a motorcycle. Because, you know? <laughs> like, I'm having a midlife crisis. And, uh, <laughs> you know, well, I couldn't afford a Porsche. So. <laughs> but uh, I was just riding around on a fucking motorcycle, and that is such a blast. And people, this is crazy, people who know me. People who, like, I was talking to this woman who knew me back before meth ever came into the picture. She's known me my whole adult life. And she's like, don't get a motorcycle. I'm like, well, what do you, you know me. And you're, if I get an idea in my head and you're going to tell me how to do it, I was like, what are you, dumb? Anyways, I love her. But uh, what a blast. I'm so high right now. It's goofy. Um, don't get a motorcycle. They're dangerous. I'm a nurse. Listen to me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's another thing. I got sober, eighth grade graduate, um, and went and became a nurse. And, um, one of these days, they're going to f- figure it out and tell me to go home. But uh, it's been a few years now. They haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. I just got a new position in a new facility I'm pretty psyched about. Yeah, uh, we'll see that how that goes. And uh, so, I think my time's wrapping up. And uh, so that's what it was, what I was like a little bit, and uh, what happened. And uh, what I'm like now is like I'm starting to figure out at 13 years sober that my character defects aren't going anywhere; <laughs> they're still fucking right there. And uh, what I get by working the steps is I get to become of, of maximum service to others. Yeah, it varies on a given day. Uh, um, but if I'm focused on myself and what I'm not getting or what I'm getting and this and that, I start getting all twisted up in anxiety and fear. And uh, um, I'm, of, I'm not of service to anybody, uh, myself or anybody else. Mm-hmm. And so I get th- this... Reliance upon a God, which it's it's so difficult. God actually talks to me, and uh, not burning. But I haven't had a burning bush yet. Just a voice in my head it tells me to do stuff like get a motorcycle, become a nurse, <laughs> uh, and work the steps, things like that. Um, so I have this relationship with God, which is really awkward for an atheist, you know, <laughs> and. Um, but I have a functioning, and so I was talking with my sponsor earlier today about the quality of faith. It's easy to have faith when it's something that you already know or believe. It's, it's another matter to have faith in something that you don't know. And I, I can't comprehend God. It's beyond My God is beyond my comprehension. Yet I have faith. It varies on a given day. 
or quality of my faith, that I'm being led by a loving higher power, you know? And um, it's just way better than uh, smoking meth in the porn booth. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, so I show up here and I, I allow that um, God will remove uh, or relieve me from my character defects given I work the steps and I, and I actually get to show up and be of help and of service to other alcoholics, you know, here and, and elsewhere. This is the best still going. I mean, I, I can't sell you AA. I just can't. I could try. It's like, it would be like trying to tell me not to get a motorcycle. You know, you're, you're either buying this, you're either drinking this Kool-Aid or you're not. But um, I can share my experience, which is that for me, this has been the best deal going. And it hasn't always been easy in 13 years. Um, for sure, life shows up. And uh, one time I would gotten away from AA and I was running the show myself at 10 years sober. And some hard things happened. And I was uh, driving to a liquor store with tears streaming down my face, not wanting to go back to that darkness and driving to the liquor store anyways. Because on my own, you know, and, I, and again, this voice came into my head and goes, why don't you rely on me like you used to? I go, deal. You know, and I've been back here since. I'm just diving in, uh, hanging out with you guys. I love alcoholics and addicts. I've been hanging out with you guys since like fifth grade when we were trying to sniff Elmer's glue and get high, you know? Uh, back in the back of the elementary room. Oh, fuck, I love addicts and alcoholics. You, you can't get high sniffing Elmer's glue, but we tried. Uh, anyways, on to Anne. Thank you. Cool. I'd like to turn the meeting over to our main speaker, Anne. Hi, I'm Anne. I'm an alcoholic addict. Hi, I'm, I'm going to sit, if that's okay. I have a dog. Um, he's my ESA. Um, so I have, I think, 11 months today or tomorrow. It just hit me right now, sitting here. Um, yeah, um, super humbling. Um, super humbling. It took me about two years to get um, 11 months clean and sober, um, relapsed. I came to Oakland and I remember picking up a chip at chips and cake and I picked up eight years an eight year chip. And then I was like, I vow to never go back to chips and cake ever again. <laughs> and I just started, um, I don't know, just, <laughs> so sorry. I just started, uh, diving more into my stressful job and, um, then um, I started living with non-sober people. One was so, had, who had been in AA, one of my roommates, and um, she had quit doing AA. And the other atheist in the house, he would argue with me and tell me, like, why AA doesn't work. <laughs> or this uh, neuroscientist, I mean, <laughs> that I live with. Um, so these, I'm just, I'm not saying that these were, like, the reasons why I went out. And then Trump was elected president and I was like, fuck it. The world is going to end. Fuck it. And, um, I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't find a sponsor yet. I wasn't dialed in. I didn't meet anyone of the flip fellowship. I had eight years. I had like a badass felt, uh, like program in San Francisco. And like, um, my program looked like speaking, uh, chairing at a meeting once a week somewhere, uh, going to four meetings a week, uh, like, sponsoring women, um, bringing, uh, AA meetings to the seventh street, um, the San Francisco jail on the first Sunday of the month. I did that for a year. I had like little sponsees in there who, um, were like facing trial for over like up to a year and over a year. And I really bonded with these women and like I was feeling it and I was at a, a total high, like in AA, really loving AA. It, it had become my life. Like, um, and Five days after the uh, the elections in 2016, um, I started drinking. And what I kind of, re you know, I kind of realized was I kind of, like, craft cocktails. It started looking good. <laughs> and um, 
I had forgot. I was so removed from my first day in AA and my last day drinking and using at that point. And I had pulled a geographic because I um, started working in Pleasanton. And so, dude, that fueled my um, many relapses. I just remember uh, being at Lakeshore Lushes and being the coffee um, commitment and just coming in every week being a newcomer for like six months, I swear. It was just... It was humility. It was humiliating for me in the beginning, but after a while, I was like, "Fuck it, I don't care. I'm just gonna keep raising my hand because, like, I really want this to work out." Because while I was out there, I have to say, like, nothing else worked. I tried refuge recovery. I tried all these other things, and then I found, like, um, you know, the woman who uh, speaks about law of attraction. I forget her. I would, I would follow her. I would see her. Uh, speaking and then I found her YouTube um like series about um her version of what the 12 steps should be it should be more positive and like I was like finding every other reason to not be an AA I was like resentful and angry and I was out there for a while um I mean not for a while thank god um and I just realized as I was trying to um get sober I just saw my life disintegrating and everything I had worked for just crumbling because like my inside I was dying and um I didn't have severe consequences like this time except for like I would you know all the rules that I had set up for myself in my eight years of recovery um I broke I'm like um I won't drink and drive um I I would never drink and drive I just doing all this shady shit you know um but anyways um so the last I year and a half to two years I've been like struggling like mostly being a newcomer and then like 11 months ago um I just I seriously I just I hit a spiritual bottom and I like I'm gonna get emotional because it's my first time I have like this much time this year and um my girlfriend Leah um I told her what had happened the night before and she's like she was like I don't want to go to your funeral. I don't want you to die. And something like about her, the way she said it, and she wasn't forcing me to do anything. I just, she was like, I think rehab might be good for you. And I was like, oh my God. And then I was like, okay, I'll call. I'll call. And like, she's like, gave me the numbers. She gave me MPI, like all these numbers. And like, she's like, if you're not going to call, I'm going to call. I'm like, okay, I'll call. And she's like, okay, call me back. And then, then I had like, I remember one day, I had one day that morning, um, I had gotten fucked up the night before. I was just like, I don't know how I got back home from the con. Oh no. Yeah, I, I do. My friend, my friend's favorite people were like, it was like his favorite concert ever. And he got, had gotten the tickets. Like they didn't even come on. And I was so fucked up. I couldn't even get home. I was like, can we leave? And like, he had to take me home. And like, seriously, that friend, was so pissed at me for like, like for a long time let me say <laughs> and um I just spoke to him today like we're cool but things are different you know this is like family you know <laughs> um anyways I I dove in um and uh I'm kind of grateful for uh the relapsing because uh I didn't have this thing called humility before I was so cocky I was so like, I thought I was like hot shit. I thought I, my program was amazing and I had eight years. I was speaking everywhere. I was giving service. I never said no to chairing. I mean, I was doing stuff most people didn't want to do, like going to the jails, going um, to the like um, rehabs and like, um, it was really fulfilling, you know, it was really fulfilling. And I had found my like groove, but in Oakland, I, it didn't look like that. And so, um, for me, uh, it was about not thinking about, I had eight years before and it was just getting back to basics. It was like finding a sponsor. Oh my gosh. And another thing I fired seven sponsors while I was relapsing. Like, seriously, I'm surprised that the women are still talking to me. <laughs> I would like something like, you know, my wires would cross and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And then I would fire yet another sponsor. But like, finally, I was just like, I'm going to just pick one. And like, I heard her share in a meeting and I always heard her share and like always res something she said always resonated with me. Like, she and I just realized she was always, she's so kind. She's a kind person. And so like, 
I needed that in my life. So I need something, somebody who would be in my life, who would show up, who'd meet with me, and who'd be kind and compassionate. Because, like, I've had fucked up trauma in my life, so I can't, like, do the hardcore Bible thumper, like, um, sponsor anymore. I need, like, a kind, compassionate Bible thumper, you know, um, or a big book thumper. Um, and so it worked, and um, we met every week, and we just we just banged out the steps and, um, and it's funny because I, 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 we, like, she asked me to do all these things and I never listen. I'm like, what? I hate a vision for you. I, I hate this meeting, but she's like, I suggest you come cause this is the meeting. Like, um, I go to, and I, I like went there for like seriously 10 months doing the steps, meeting like an hour and a half ahead before the meeting and just sitting there like hating the meeting. Like, and then towards the end, I realized like, oh my God, this meeting's actually kind of great. Like it was just me all along. Um, I'm kind of doing this backwards, but I uh, want to kind of go into um, my past, um, the relapsing and the, the doing the steps. I've done the steps like four times, four times now. This is my fourth time. Uh, the funny thing is now she wants me to find sponsees. I'm like, oh. I'm like, I just kind of want to meet with you and like do more steps, you know, but she's like, uh, just find sponsees. You're like, you're free to find sponsees. And I found one. It was amazing, but she, um, kind of left AA. So, but I was like, okay, I have six months. You have three. This is great, <laughs> but it was good. I like really get, um, I have this love for the big book um, and the traditions and the steps. Um, I just was so excited to share with her, like, Dr. Bob's opinion, um, just, like, just the stories that really get me off, like, um, like how the word spirituality is, like, um, you know, threaded in there without being explicitly stated, stuff like that. Like, I got to share with her. I'm like, it's her first time in AA. Yeah, like, I don't expect the newcomers to really stick with me when I – bring them through the steps. So I don't get personally attached or anything, but she, she was like, she said something and then she left. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but now she has like a big book and like a 12 and 12 and she's out in the world. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to like go back to where I came from. It's so crazy. It's like, it's t like the round of steps is like kind of teaching me about like this, uh, another layer, layer of like the onion that I never had the balls to like deal with while, um, in my first, um, eight years of sobriety. And that was my, um, my resentment towards my family and, um, you know, some, some trauma, like, um, like sexual trauma and, um, just a lot of abuse growing up. Um, I got to deal with that. And I actually like, came around and I had this one day, it was like, I had such lightness. I picked up the phone and I like called my parents and, you know, my parents are hardcore, strict, old school Koreans. Like I swear I had to like sneak out of the house at like 21 when I came back to the house, um, after college. And I was like, I can't fucking do this. Like I would sneak, I would like crawl through the forest with my heels in my hands. Then I would like crawl through the dark and then like go to my car and like start it in neutral in the dark and go down this like windy hill just to go clubbing. You know, <laughs> I was like, I can't do this anymore. But, um, but, um, what I struggle, I, I struggled with, with my family. I was so angry, like, um, so angry, angry for so long. And I blamed them for so long. Um, and that kind of lifted and that's a gift in and of itself. Like, you know, my, my father hasn't changed and I just accept he'll never change. Like all he talks to me about, this is like our, our regular phone calls. Hi, how are you doing? Great. Um, where's my, uh, where's my grandchild? Where's my grandson? I was like, I don't even have a boyfriend. Um, when are you going to get married? Um, when I find a boyfriend, <laughs> you, um, <laughs> he's, and then he'll say, I'll buy you a house. I'm like, okay. Um, and then I play along that I want to do what, whatever this is, you know, um, and I get off the phone, but like the last call, I was like, I love you. Hey, uh, I'm like, I love you. And I, I thought he was so hilarious. I was like, dad, you're so cute. I'm like, dad, you're so cute. You're just so adorable. And I love you. Um, and this was the same man at my law school graduation where he was like, you look like a hooker. Like right before I went up there, I was like to get my, um, um, you know, to graduate from law school. Um, and I was at Davies hall. It was a huge ceremony ceremony. And I walked across, I rocked, walked across the stage and I was like, 
I was like a zombie because I, I was so like that just brought me back to just childhood, like and just broken, you know. So I'm just gonna let him loose if you guys don't mind. Sorry. Um. So um, yeah. So um, yeah. It's, I just want to get back to. It's so funny how it this addiction and alcoholism could strike anyone. It knows no color, no class, no, like, it, you could have, like, a CEO position. You could just, or you could be, like, homeless and sober, you know, or it's just, like, you don't know, like, it's, like, this was crazy. Um, I pretty much, you know, I grew up, I went to pr pr private schools all my life, and then I went to UC Davis, and then I my alcoholism started and, you know, and on the outside, everything looks really great. And then I went off and running. I got fucked up and I went in, out in a blaze. I found meth. I did alcohol. I did crack. I did everything. And I just went out and I lost my soul out there. I committed crimes. I picked up a rap sheet. I like got arrested nine times in like three years. I, my parents thought I was dead for eight years. They'd hired like, um, what do you call those people who like look for people? Yes. Um, and they couldn't find me because I had never had, a, I was homeless out there on the streets committing crimes. And, um, and so that's kind of like how bad it got. And I, it just got worse and worse and worse. And I thought, I like really thought I was going to die in shame and guilt um, because that was my fate. And because I had no other, no other, uh, this was me, this was, I was cursed, you know? And the fact that I found AA was what, um, well, the jails kind of like, kind of sobered me up, um, got me into like a pro, the last time I got arrested, I had to go to jail for like six months. I was like, damn, that's a long time. And they offered me this like um, hardcore um, behavior modification program. And they were like, and my parole officer's like, just do it. I was like, what do I do? He's like, just do it. I'm like, okay, I'll just do it. And I listened to someone. And then I did like choices in uh, Redwood City Jail. And that was like my first taste of AA. And it just changed my life. And um, Carla, my counselor at Choices in Jail, she came to my law school graduation. Um, she was out there. And... Um, just, she was, she was just like, I'm so proud of you. And, um, my family came and then like, um, my J Jewish parents came, my Korean parents came and my black parents came. So <laughs> I felt super like these are the people who gave me life, you know, um, or gave me a chance in this world. And, um, so, um, yeah, so I had climbed out of that hell hole and I expunged all my records. I like went in front of a judge. All my uh, sober sisters, they wrote me letters of support. And um, I shared that shit with the judge. I like seriously have fought for my like freedom. <laughs> so I won't even like break laws anymore. I'm like kind of like a little hardcore about it, except for like, I'll go parking laws. I'll do parking laws, I'll break <laughs> parking laws. But um, yeah, and um, so when I had relapsed, I was like some major, that was like a huge decision. Cause I had just climbed out of that and, um, seriously started, I went, I got into law school. I, I, you know, I just created a little career and to make that decision to go out. It's like the word fuck it entered my mind for the first time. You know, I had never said fuck it before and it was off and running. And, um, I'm just grateful. I mean, like, I'm just grateful that like I'm here, I'm sober. I'm, you know, didn't have to go through losing everything and going out like how hard hardcore I know I'm capable of going out. Um, and that like something called, it's really funny. Like this morning, I, 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 you know, the hardest thing for me, um, in, in recovery is to find like self love. So, um, this one day I, I was, I had been on step 11 and, um, my sponsor and I, we were like uh, back in the day in San Francisco, we were kind of researching all these different forms of like spirituality. I would go to Buddhist temples. I would chant. I would like go to like 
spirit rock. I was just, doing, you know, checking out everything. And I just wanted to find something. I was taking meditation and meta classes. And my meta teacher was like, you know, she pulled me aside and she's like, you know, I just feel like, um, you don't, um, you don't, you don't love your, you don't see yourself the way, um, people see you. And she like told me like this one simple thing I'm going to share it with you guys. So, um, like in the morning or any time in the day, just like put your hand on your heart and just say, I just, this is what I say. I love you, Anne, really loud. And I could be at a fucking crosswalk, standing, waiting for the light. I'm like, I love you, Anne. And I wake up in the morning and that's the first thing I do. I tell myself I love myself. I tell my dog I love him and I thank God. And I like um, do a, a couple things that I'm grateful for or I pray for somebody who's out hurting, you know? Um, and just like, one day that lifted. And like, I think that that kind of saved me this time. Um, when I was relapsing, cause I had a little bit of self love, like before I didn't have, and that's what was like the, um, what was like the determining factor of why I didn't go out as hard as I did. Um, and so, um, Oh, 855. Yeah. I didn't even like talk about my drunk log. <laughs> I should have like, Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's what my kind, Oh, I have to say, like, there's a couple things. Like I see myself, I see myself getting kind of petty lately. Like in the beginning I was so hungry and I was like starving. I was like really wanting this program wanted to get sober, even though I was kind of complaining, I would still do everything. I would show up. But lately, like, Oh, what, what my ideal program is I have three home groups two or three commitments and I go to like the fourth meeting a week, you know, so I go to three or four meetings a week and I, um, I meet with my sponsor or I like find uh, women who are really about the program and who are fun also, because, um, I really, before I would just like, you know, my friends would be like, initially would be like women who, I don't know, like, I, it's not like I'm, like, judging or whatever, but, like, I can't um, sit around and complain about AA, um, so I, like, I'm attracted to um, the women who are, like, really about the program, who have solution, because if I was going to be um, knocking AA and, like, you know, doing shady shit, I might, as just, I might as well just go out there and use and drink, you know, like, it's the same thing for me, um, like, what attracts me to uh, this program is, like, I don't know. I just like feel like I have this kind of like this lightness and I have faith that I'm going to like tomorrow there's, there's like a future for me or just this like belief in myself that things are going to be better and I will always be taken care of. I don't have that when I'm drinking. It's just weird. It's just like constant like self absorbed, like, you know, non ending like cycles of thought, you know? like destructive thought. And, um, I'm free from that finally. And I just feel like, um, that, you know, I like being in the program, like having good, strong girlfriends who are about the program. So like, um, I have girlfriends who have like 25 years or 15 years and like all my litter mates, you know, so I have a good little mixture. And, um, I just noticed myself being kind of petty though lately. Like, I mean, Okay, so my um, home groups are like, I co-secretary a meeting on Sunday night, the meditation meeting at Rockbridge, and I have a home group on Tuesday nights, girls night out, and um, it, the third home group used to be Lakeshore Lushes, but I swear, I caught a resentment, and I haven't been back there for like four weeks, because like some guy was kind of inappropriate and creeped me out, so I was like hiding. And so I have to say like my, <laughs> my, you know, my thing was like, um, I was just like, I'm never going to go back there again, you know? Um, but without really talking about it, I didn't tell people about it, just a few women, but like, I'm just going to openly, you know, talk about it. If that, um, if that happens, I realize like being quiet about it is kind of like hiding. And if I speak about it, it's like protecting myself and it's not mean or, you know, like, um, whatever. Um, and so that, um, that was initial thing that kind of like, you know, made me sw like, um, get off the path of like three home groups, you know, commitments. I had three commitments. I think I have a commitment there that I just walked off of. Oh my God. I forgot. I forgot about that. Actually, I should go back, um, and pick it up. Um, and then, 
like my other, like my meeting on Tuesday nights, they're trying to ban Puffy. My, my da- dog's name is Puff Daddy. And they're trying to ban him. And I'm like, oh my God, these women, I like, they like have these meetings about, you know, without saying my name or my dog's name. And they're trying to um, stick me in a corner in the back with, next to a sign. And I'm like, um, I have a mental disability. Um, this is like my ESA. This isn't just a fluffy doll I'm carrying around. Like he's not my like, you know, he's not like my other purse, you know, um, and stuff like that is, you know, would usually have like driven me away. But like what I can do now is like remove like my, my anger and try to pause and try to like actually like educate them. Like that's kind of unconstitutional. I mean, that's discriminatory you're not going to tell the person of color to to sit in the back like who has a mental disability you know based off of like that you know stuff like that I could just actually just talk and open the room for communication like to like open the discussion and even if I don't get my way whatever you know I just at least I could like stick around not run away and like you know share like with people like what my thoughts are and like that's part of being um, healthy and being in my space. And um, yeah, and I got this dog. Okay, so I got sober on September 10, September 11 or 10. I don't remember. It's in my uh, sober app. It's right. Yeah. And um, I do. Oh, it's so funny. I couldn't. MPI had said, we'll allow you when there's room, but you have to have five days sober. I was like, what? Are you serious? And then I went to Lakeshore Lushes and a meeting every night. And I spoke about how I'm so scared. I'm not going to be able to have five days because I really need a program. And I spoke about it. And, like, people just poured their love and showed up and, like, gave me numbers. People were calling me, helping me through, the you know, the next five days. And um, my, my uh, sponsor at the time, she said, oh, I have a day, my day off. It was, like, a Tuesday. She was like, I'm going with you. So she went with me to MPI and like, I was like, I could do this. I could do this. And then they're, they're like, oh, this is how much it's going to cost. I was like, what? Fuck that. And I was like, oh no, 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 I got to go. And then, so, um, my sponsor chases after me and she's like, okay, ask them if they can split it in 12 months. And I'm like, oh, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. And like, they actually allowed that. So I'm still paying, I'm like $300 away from paying off my rehab. I'm so proud of that, you know? (laughs) And I had a lot of like financial consequences of last year. So, um, and I'm doing some financial amends. So there's a lot of, it's like a lot of money issues right now. It's like the financial fear is kind of with me is like what's with me. And, um, usually it's like love or finances and it's finances right now. And, um, and I, um, I just kind of keep like splitting the payments up and, um, I'm just, I'm not going to find, I'm not asking how much I, I, I'm not looking at how much more I owe. I know by like, I'm just going to like just chip away at it and be okay with it, you know? Um, because like, I can't, um, I am so grateful for rehab. Like it just changed everything. All I had to do was show up and I felt so relieved. I was like, Oh my God. And then they gave free food. I was like, hell yeah. And I made friends and I'm still like friends with these people. Um, even today. So, um, we had a really close group of friends. Another thing that I have to, like, I wanted to talk about was, um, the whole justified anger. That's so my fucking jam. I am like, ah, I hate that. I have, I'm super chill and like, chipper and happy until I have that. And oh my God, my fury is like hardcore. And I've unleashed it at work. I've unleashed it. Like this guy was like, this guy was super like misogynistic and it was his first day though. And I was kind of, I could have, I should have been kind and compassionate. <laughs> I fucking cussed him out and I put him in his place because it felt good, and I felt like the biggest asshole. This was his first date. Even though he's misogynistic, he's, like, 70 years old or something, you know, and I felt so bad. I was like, oh, my God, I could have, like, been, like, welcoming and, like, trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Now I cussed him out, and my boss was sitting there, and he saw it, and he just – I didn't realize he was there because – 
I was just so in this, like, you know, I saw red and I fucking cussed him out and it was really bad. And then like, um, a couple months later, my boss kind of was like, Oh yeah, I was there. I was like, what? Like, I don't want to give off that, like, you know, I don't want people to fear me because of my temper. Um, I want, I, I, will, I, I immediately went back. I did a meditation. There's a wellness room in my office. I, I meditated. I went back to him and I fucking apologized for cussing him out that day. And that's program right there. And I actually started giving him a chance and I still think he's misogynistic and whatever, mm -hmm. but he, it doesn't have to affect me. And he's not like the person who he's not my boss, you know, just let it go, you know? And, um, and it's so funny because like he got fired. I mean, he started after me and he got fired. I had some HR issue, but nobody will talk about. So I'm sure it has something to do with some major misogynistic something. Like it was like that bad, I think. Um, and nobody could talk about it, but weird stuff. Like I don't have to be the person like, you know, controlling that person, like to try to get that person out. Like that would have been me before, but now it's like, just do stay in my own lane and do my own thing. And like what I pray for in the morning is God just like, give me like, give me like the courage to be humble. I want to be humble and kind and compassionate and tolerant. Like help me be of service to my fellows and to be, to be a good coworker. And I really believe in the 11 step um, and the 11 step prayer has really brought me such peace the last uh, 11 months. And I think that's kind of like one of my most favorite steps um, and third step. Um, Anyways, I am just grateful that somebody asked me to share. I forget who even asked me, but um, I, had, I had walked in and was not expecting this. Um, but um, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.